Hello and welcome to the 14th edition of How India Votes. Uh, those of you who have been following uh, this series, uh, we started in August and now in January we have been able to do uh, uh, 14 such conversations in the run-up to 2024 elections. And the idea behind this conversation series is uh, to look how Indians vote from different perspectives. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. My name is Rahul Verma and I work here at the Center for Policy Research. Uh, what like So there are a couple of things I would like to outline before introducing the panel uh, and then uh, we'll start with the presentation and then the conversation. But I would also request uh, uh, everyone, if you have questions or comment, please keep putting that on Q&A box. We'll try to respond some of them there, but I can also weave some of your questions in round two and round three uh, with our co-panelists. So it's 25th January, an important day because we celebrate National Voters Day today. And I thought uh, having a conversation on why some issues don't matter to voters is uh, important because we keep uh, discussing why some issues matter and, and, and those issues tend to be largely related to either identity ideology or related to uh, material benefits, uh, but some issues like uh, air pollution, uh, especially in the months of November, December, and January, those of us who live in Delhi uh, feel the wrath of it, but uh, it seems that it's not a part of any political conversation. So the question, uh, while the focus of today's conversation is going to be much more on air pollution, we can also, uh, perhaps towards the end of the talk, uh, zoom out of it and think about why some issues don't matter uh, in electoral politics and why some issues like politicians and parties don't mobilize on them and why voters don't care about them. So air pollution is an example to think about this larger question of why some issues gain electoral salience versus uh, some don't. Uh, and just to sort of like uh, lay out this idea, one could be Perhaps there are issues for it doesn't matter to anyone. No one cares about it. And so neither politicians nor voters are interested uh, on some of these things. It's only researchers, journalists, and, uh, uh, you know, those people think and write on these things. The second could be uh, uh, in, in uh, sort of like classic political science uh, terms uh, is to think about that there are issues uh, about which perhaps only a small minority segment cares and maybe elite segments care and politicians and parties don't uh, want to focus on issues that matters to only a small segment of the population. Uh, it may uh, uh, sort of like become part of policy making agendas and uh, may get discussed in parliament and, and uh, a bill is or an act is passed on some of those issues but it does not become part of electoral campaigning and mobilization on the ground. And the third kind of uh, uh, sort of line of inquiry has been that politicians actually care about what you'll call as visible issues versus what are invisible issues. So things that uh, can be seen by voters and can be like credit can be claimed on some of those things, politicians are going to care about some of those issues. So they can talk about whether they manage to build a road or, or some flyover or something like that. But solving a problem like air pollution is one going to take longer, needs much more coordination. And then by the time you start and end it, you don't know whether you'll be able to claim credit on that. And so uh, there is no incentive in that sense uh, for politicians and parties to invest and mobilize on some of these things. So these are just sort of like uh, outli to outline some hypotheses. Of course, there are many more. Uh, and to discuss both the question of uh, why air pollution uh, does not figure as an electoral issue, even in the context of Delhi, uh, because here we have, so it's not a visible, uh, invisible divide because everyone can see this. It matters to a significant section of Delhi population, at least, uh, uh, you know, and perhaps even in 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 urban areas uh, of of the country. Uh, so 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 we'll focus on the air pollution, but we'll also zoom out and discuss uh, about the larger uh, and bigger picture uh, of why some issues don't matter. Uh, to join uh, uh, on this discussion, I have a set of stellar. Uh, panelists. So let me introduce uh, uh, them and then uh, uh, we'll start a conversation. 
Uh, we have uh, Tariq Thatchel. Uh, Tariq is a great friend, but also a supporter of us at Center for Policy Research. Uh, Tariq uh, is a professor of political science at uh, University of Pennsylvania, where he also directs the Center for Advanced Study of India. Thank you, Tariq, uh, for joining us. Uh, Tariq has two very, very interesting books, uh, uh, one which looks at uh, how do elite parties mobilize poor voters? And the second one, which came out recently with Adam Orbach, looks at migrants and machine politics in urban areas of India. So thank you, Tariq, for joining us. Uh, Tariq uh, is, uh, uh, you know, is going to present a paper with his co-author, Shikhar. Shikhar uh, is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, uh, KASI, uh, Center for Advanced Study of India at University of Pennsylvania. Shikhar also finished his PhD at uh, from Yale University. And uh, in a week from now, you might see a piece from him uh, in Hindustan Times, which appeared on the Carnegie website today, where he's actually looking at uh, welfare policies and some of the important welfare programs that have been implemented uh, in last few years by the Indian government and what kind of impact it has on citizens and voters. So uh, thank you, Shikhar, for joining us today. Uh, we are all joined by... Uh, uh, Jayashree Nandi. Jayashree has been tracking uh, climate and uh, uh, air pollution and environment. She writes for Hindustan Times. And I have, uh, like, I'm, I don't, I'm not a person who follow environment and climate change uh, that often, but I find her uh, stories uh, uh, and reportage very, very useful uh, to look at how people on the ground uh, think about some of those uh, issues. So thank you, Jayashree, uh, for joining us. Uh, finally, uh, my ex-colleague, and still, uh, you know, uh, hopefully we'll continue to uh, find ways to meet and work together. So uh, Bhargo Krishna was at the Center for Policy Research. Uh, now uh, uh, the climate team at Center for Policy Research has started a new initiative, and Bhargo is fellow at Sustainability Futures. He also coordinates uh, their program on environmental governance and policy. Uh, Bhargav, of course, has been writing about climate and environmental issues. But Bhargav is also part of a group of, of uh, you know, uh, which also involves certain members of parliament uh, who have been discussing issues uh, of air pollution for quite some time. So I thought Bhargav can also uh, bring some of the dinner table conversation. Sorry, Bhargav, just pulling your leg. Uh, but what do politicians uh, like, you know, uh, uh, at least in the closed door atmosphere, uh, uh, where they are having a serious conversation, uh, what they are thinking and what they are doing about some of these issues. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, let's start with uh, Shikhar and uh, Tariq's paper and learn what do voters in Delhi think about air pollution issue and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rahul, for that uh, introduction. And uh, I know that Shikhar and I are really looking forward to um, hearing from both the audience and from uh, Jayashree and Bhargav. Um, I should clarify, you know, note that we are not experts on the subject of air pollution. We're really more scholars of uh, uh, political behavior and public opinion. And so it's from that lens that we're going to approach today's discussion. But we really look forward to learning from our co-panelists who have much more experience and expertise um, on this subject matter. But I'll just begin by saying uh, from where Rahul left off, that part of the reason we were interested in the um, issue of air pollution is precisely because of many of the kind of quote unquote environmental issues that you could think about, specifically those that might affect urban voters. Um, it is perhaps the one that we might ex most like, uh, uh, most expect to see uh, voters care about because uh, unlike other aspects of environmental change that may be more slow moving, may be less visible um, as Rahul mentioned, um, air pollution certainly in contexts like Delhi and at the levels that it is in many Indian cities, not just Delhi, is very visible. Um, its consequences, at least for public health, are quite immediate um, and, and, and adverse. And so those are features, and we can kind of come back to this in the Q&A, but those are features that you might think would make for an issue uh, becoming more politically salient or electorally salient. Um, and so that's kind of the motivation, you know, certainly when um, I'm in Delhi or in uh, many Indian cities, there's kind of a lot of armchair conversation about air pollution and a lot of belly aching about air pollution. But our interest was, you know, is this uh, transitioning into kind of electoral salience? And so uh, let me just begin. So Shikhar and I will jointly present um, uh, just very quickly some of our findings. We have short time, so I'm going to go quickly. 
um, and dive right into it. This is not an audience for whom I have to introduce, you know, how bad air pollution is in India. I'm going to take that, take it that everybody knows that. Um, but so basically where we'll start with is uh, kind of both of us trying to understand why air pollution is not a politically salient issue. Now, what do I mean by that? So we measure it in two ways in our paper. Um, one is that we looked across several public opinion surveys, five representative surveys conducted between 2013 to 2020 that had representative samples of Delhi voters. And essentially when voters were asked uh, what important election issues were for them, less than 2% identified air pollution or even in some cases, the broader category of environmental degradation as an important election issue. And because this happened across multiple surveys, we kind of, uh, you know, definitely compared to uh, the standard issues we look at, whether it's unemployment or inflation or even sanitation, um, an issue like air pollution or the environment rated fairly low. We also looked at another potential indicator of political salience, which is protest. So even outside of the ballot box and through our colleagues at UPenn's uh, Dev Lab and PDRI, uh, those uh, they have a repository of almost 8 million news reports from um, eight different news sources that they collected between 2012 and 2023, both in um, uh, English and in vernacular languages. And when we queried that 8 million uh, uh, report ba database, we basically found evidence of uh, ba barely any evidence of citizen mobilization on air pollution. So in fact, the line looks flat because essentially we find no protests across this time. The little spikes that we do see, the biggest one, and you can't even really see it here because it's so small, was um, the only known protest we could find. And again, if others know of others, we're, we're happy. We, we would like that feedback, which was in Delhi in November 2019, where a few hundred people gathered at India Gate to protest air pollution. Uh, and even in the news reports of that, many of the organizers expressed their dismay at how few people had shown up and how quickly the protests dissipated. So I, you know, we don't really see evidence that in the protest sphere, this is this is a big issue. So diving right into what we were trying to think through in the paper, we look at five possible reasons why air pollution may not be electorally salient um, in a place like Delhi. And I'm just very quickly tell you what these are in a in a just a, a very simple way. The first is this idea of um, kind of conventional expectations about voters in settings like India and in the larger like uh, global literature on political behavior. The first is that voters may simply lack information and awareness on this issue. So they may not really be aware of how severe um, the issue of air pollution is or lack key information about it. The second is, is, is about holding uh, state actors responsible. So if they're going to be uh, mobilized on it politically, they should think that the governments that they elect are responsible for this problem or responsible for fixing the problem and maybe have some clarity over which tier of government. And this is certainly an issue that you might think of in Delhi. Which tier of government do I hold responsible in a multi-tiered setting like India? Do I hold my local government, my provincial government or my national government responsible? And if voters are, are disparate in which tier they hold responsible, perhaps that prevents them from coming together and really crystallizing this as an issue at any one level or holding any one political actor level accountable. Uh, the third, which is a very popular explanation in the kind of transnational scholarship on public opinion on these kinds of issues is that voters and especially voters in relatively low income settings are going to privilege development and economic growth over the environment and going to perceive a trade off between those two things. Uh, the fourth and fifth explanations, the fourth one comes often from I, the scholarship I, in, yeah. Can you, can you uh, uh, like uh, display full screen because people are not able to see. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, I don't know why that's, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Thank you for letting me know. Please tell me if it's now coming. Is it now full screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. great. Sorry about that. Um, so if we think of these conventional expectations, you know, are voters informed and aware? Are they clear about holding the government responsible and which tier? Should they, um, uh, do they value development over the environment? The two other explanations we look at, one comes from the, is, is very strong in the US context, which is this idea of uh, partisanship, perhaps uh, creating an issue or an obstacle to accountability pressures on, on an issue like air pollution, by which we mean if voters selectively blame uh, the uh, party that they do not support, 
So if we have party A and party B and voters, supporters of party A disproportionately blame party B for an issue and vice versa, then that might diminish incentives for political actors to actually do anything on this issue because they know that their supporters are not going to are not going to blame them. And conversely, no matter what they do, opposition supporters are going to blame them. And finally, we thought about perhaps there is a not sufficient support, even if you think it's an issue, even if you hold government responsible, you don't particularly support any kind of mitigation policy uh, that might be perceived as costly. So the public may have low support for actually doing anything about it. And uh, if it's not low, maybe it's fractured. So maybe different kinds of residents of, this, of a city like Delhi, uh, maybe rich or poor or from different caste backgrounds uh, may actually support different kinds of mitigation policies. And we'll explain what that means in a minute. So these are the kinds of explanations we were looking to test in our paper. Shikhar? Great, thank you, Tarek. So to test these explanations, we fielded a survey in Delhi between March and May of last year. Uh, and uh, this was a representative household level survey of about 3,100 respondents. Uh, and the way we uh, essentially surveyed was to select uh, at random 30 constituencies out of Delhi's 70, uh, 70 constituencies. And within those randomly select two polling stations, and within each polling station, use the voter list to randomly select voters who would participate in the survey. So on the left here, you see a map of Delhi uh, with uh, the 70 constituencies of Delhi. Uh, and in gray are the assembly constituencies where we ended up fielding the survey. And the orange dots are where uh, the precise locations where the survey was conducted. The survey was broadly representative of Delhi demographics. So 86% uh, uh, of our sample were Hindu. Uh, uh, nearly half, about 47% were female. Um, the average age of the respondent in the survey was about 39. Uh, and politically speaking, about 44% of the sample were BJP voters. Uh, so, so let's dive straight into what, uh, what some of these explanations were and what kind of evidence we encountered uh, in favor or, or, or against each of them. So the first is issue awareness and salience. Uh, is... Uh, air pollution even important top of the mind in the Delhi voters' mind. So uh, here is a figure where on the left side, we ask a question about how important it is on a 0 to 10 scale to voters in Delhi. Uh, and on the right side, we have a measure of impact that is impact on daily life. So let me start with the left side. Uh, when we ask voters how important a problem air pollution is on a scale of 0 to 10, on average, Delhi voters uh, give a score of about 8.2 out of 10. For benchmarking purposes, garbage and sewage disposal or things related to kind of cleanliness uh, is one of the top concerns that one encounters in this level of government. Uh, and that receives a score of 8 out of 10. In other words, it is uh, uh, in breathing distance, if not excess of one of the most important issues that already is politically salient, let's say at the municipal level, uh, more salient than that. In terms of its political, uh, in terms of its impact on everyday life, uh, we asked two questions. One, does it affect your breathing? About 77% of Delhi respondents said that recognized that it did affect their uh, breathing, and it also affect their daily routine. So, for example, going for a walk or to the market or a park. Uh, about 66% people in the sample noted uh, that air pollution prevented them from doing uh, daily activities of of this kind. I think the evidence cumulatively there suggests that there is, is high salience and impact on everyday life, as we would expect. So a question then becomes uh, that do voters see this as a political issue, as something that they are willing to blame political actors for? And so uh, here are a couple of pieces of evidence, descriptive evidence from the survey. Let me start with the leftmost panel. Uh, I think all of us who have been in Delhi have encountered this this is how it is, we can do nothing about it type of explanation for air pollution. We call this fatalism, that there's a lack of agency, kuch ho nahi sakta, nothing can be done. Uh, and we ask voters by giving them a, a statement of this kind that no one can do anything about air pollution to express agreement with a statement like that uh, on a zero to 10 scale. The typical Delhi voter gives only four out of 10 in agreement to a statement like that. In other words, Contrary to what we might think, 
wide degree of fatalism is 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 not describing the state of Delhi voters' disposition towards uh, an issue like air pollution. So then we get into who do they actually blame? And what we do in the middle panel here is look at some top sources of air pollution uh, uh, as identified and frequently debated by experts and, and also include in this case, a political actor, namely the government broadly defined. And what we find is that about 28% of Delhi voters actually blame vehicle owners for air pollution, uh, vehicle air pollution, but an equal number actually blame the government in the same situation. A smaller 19% blame factory owners for industrial pollution, uh, and about three and five percent respectively for uh, uh, for crop stubble burning Punjab farmers, and about five percent for the construction industry. About a uh, 20%, 17% blame everyone for the problem. In other words, when pitted against directly pitted against emitters, a large, if not largest proportion of the electorate continue to hold a political actor responsible that is the government responsible for air pollution. To get at this in a more concrete way, the right two panels actually look at whether voters fix responsibility for air pollution at comparable levels to say something like inflation, which we know to be politically salient, not just in Delhi, uh, but in, in the country more broadly. So the third panel from the left basically says, does government inaction lead to price rise? Uh, and you see that about uh, on a zero to 10 agreement scale, Delhi voters think that is 7.36 out of 10 correct. They, that's the level of agreement that they express. And if we put the same question, does government inaction lead to polluted air? Agreement falls slightly, but is still high at about 6.5 out of 10. Um, in other words, there is a clear link between the a failure as an outcome and governmental inaction. Uh, Sorry, and the last panel, very quickly, uh, we ask whether uh, voters think it is the government's job to keep prices under check, everyday prices of commodities under check. Agreement for that is seven point uh, is 8.2 out of 10. Uh, and when we ask the same question, whether it's the government's job to provide clean air, agreement is at about 7.2 out of 10. Again, inflation is highly salient, so it's it's a it's a it's a it's a kind of highest barrier to cross. But we find that air pollution is lower, but in breathing distance of uh, of that kind of uh, uh, issue. So we don't see that willingness to blame uh, emerges as a particular constraint uh, on Delhi voters' ability to, uh, to to think of this in electoral terms. So this then moves to a, a, a related question. If, if Delhi voters think it is the government's job to resolve air pollution, then the question becomes which level of government? And as you know, Delhi has uh, a unique uh, uh, position in our federal structure. And so to get around this or to actually be robust to this, we actually measure uh, attitudes towards uh, 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 fixing responsibility in a variety of ways. So in the extreme left panel here, we uh, ask this question for Delhi itself. Uh, about 81% respondents, that is 8 out of 10, think that it is the state government, that is the Delhi state government's responsibility to deal with air pollution. Uh, a smaller... Sorry, Ashikar, this left one, the, the middle one is Delhi. I think the left one is, Sorry. Um, is yes, for UP. Uh, yeah. my, my apologies. Starting with the middle one, 76% uh, 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 of uh, of respondents uh, uh, blame the, the or think that the Delhi state government is responsible for dealing with uh, with air pollution. Uh, 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 Thirteen percent or thereabouts uh, think it's the national government, and about eleven percent think that it is uh, both governments' responsibility. We then move this question to actually uh, a Delhi suburb, Ghaziabad, which is entirely governed by one political party at the state and national levels and ask who is responsible for air pollution in Ghaziabad. Um, and, and we think this is a close proxy since it's a, it's a satellite town and has very similar uh, air pollution conditions as Delhi. Eight out of 10, 81% in that particular instance of Delhi voters think that the UP government is responsible for air pollution in Ghaziabad. About 10% think that it is the national government and about 9% think that it is both. And then since we're, we're using a particular party's control over governance in one case, we then apply the same question to who's responsible for reducing or, or containing crop stubble burning, which is a cause for air pollution in Punjab. 
and about 75% of people think it's the Punjab government's responsibility, in this case now controlled by the same party that governs Delhi's state government, only 12% the national government, only 6% the same party is Delhi government, and about 7% think uh, all tiers of government. All told, what this suggests is that there is very clear level of attribution of responsibility for air pollution at the state government. We don't hold a view on whether that's the right level of government or the wrong level of government for attribution, but it is unequivocally the case that Delhi voters, pretty much eight out of 10 in number, think that the state government is responsible for resolving this problem. So the next thing that we looked at was this idea that maybe people perceive, so if voters are informed about the issue, voters clearly think that governments are responsible for this issue and even have clarity on which tier of government to hold responsible. Perhaps one of the impediments to uh, voting on this issue is that you perceive a trade-off between curbing air pollution and pursuing economic development. And this is a kind of broadly um, theorized phenomenon. So we actually directly put this to Delhi voters. Do you think that, um, if you know there is an effort to control pollution it will either if we look at the left hand panel it will either increase reduce or have no impact on economic development and the key point here is that voters do perceive a trade off so 64% do think that economic development will reduce if there is an if there is an effort to curb air pollution however i think that maybe we would have expected however in the middle panel we asked so which is more important curbing emissions or pursuing development. And here the majority say both. And even if, uh, even outside of the majority, so 65% say both are important, but uh, of the remaining 35%, 23% actually say pollution is more important, reducing pollution is more important and pursuing just development on its own is the smallest category, 12% of voters. So the idea that development is uniquely prioritized over curbing pollution, at least in this Delhi sample, does not seem to be the case. Finally, we actually asked Delhi voter, uh, the sample uh, survey respondents to choose between uh, identical amount of uh, uh, a policy that would offer either 10,000 rupees as a subsidy for first time car buyers or a 10,000 rupee fine for uh, older vehicles uh, that were uh, more likely to be outside of um, uh, emissions uh, regulations. And uh, essentially, when, when asked which of these two policies you prefer, a policy where you could, most Delhi residents who in our sample did not own a car could actually directly benefit from uh, and a kind of redistributive or distributive policy when pitted against a kind of environmental policy, two thirds pick the pollution fine over the car subsidy. So at 62% to 38%. So in other words, even if they perceive a trade-off, uh, it's across these measures, we see no evidence that they're going to uniquely prioritize economic development, growth, or a material benefit over the curbing of air pollution. So then we looked at a couple of other factors that may be doing the work. If these kind of conventional expectations are not seeming to hold that much water in Delhi, one was looking at whether there are partisan effects that uh, drive uh, how you hold political actors responsible for this problem. So we showed respondents a picture of a power plant emitting smoke and randomly varied who scientists were said to have held responsible for not closing down such pollution causing factories from the city and its, and its outskirts, um, whether that was uh, the, the national government or the state government, the BJP or the AAP. And essentially what this figure shows, I won't go into the details, but I'll just tell you what it means, that when the target, when uh, the orange dots rep represent BJP supporters, when BJP supporters were shown this photo and told that scientists hold AAP responsible, uh, when they were then asked, who are you, who, uh, you know, uh, how, how, how much blame would you attribute to this government? They said 6.6 .6 out of 10. However, when they were shown the exact same image, but scientists were, say, were said to have said that the BJP government was responsible, and voters were then asked, you know, who do you, how much would you blame this government? Um, it decreased to 4.8. So that is that BJP supporters are much more likely to blame the AAP government than their own BJP government for exactly the same, same exact situation, uh, where scientists are said to have blamed the AAP versus when scientists are said to have blamed the BJP. 
And when we see among ARP supporters in our survey, we see the exact opposite pattern. That is that ARP supporters are much more likely to blame the BJP government than their own ARP government. So when they're told it's the BJP to blame, they measure 6.4 in their willingness to blame that government. But when they're shown the exact same situation with ARP, it's 5.2. And so what this suggests is that essentially if partisan supporters of a particular party are only willing to blame the issue when it's the other party that's held to blame. They're very selective in who they blame. This can diminish incentives in a system uh, for politicians to be held accountable. Why would they be held accountable on an issue when they know that their supporters are not likely to hold them responsible and blame the other party? And also conversely, even if they do things that are good on that issue, they're very like unlikely to get credit and win new supporters from supporters of the other party. We're happy to talk about that a little bit more. And then finally, the fifth explanation that we looked at was how much support does the Delhi public have for different policies to mitigate air pollution? And we actually ask a range of policies because we have limited time. I will not go through all of these policies, but there are a variety of policies from setting up uh, factories that generate employment but pollute the air, a one-car limit on households, and the banning of diesel cars and bikes. What I'll just say as the takeaway is that, first of all, there's a clear majority of support for these mitigation policies across residents in six of the eight policies. Um, and these policies, again, limit uh, range uh, across a wide things. But overall, in the majority of policies, we find a majority of voters and often a strong majority of voters support a pro-environmental mitigation policy. Further, uh, we do not see any divergence along caste or class lines. So this really shows, do we see differences in preferences for members of more uh, privileged versus disadvantaged caste groups? And I'm happy to be happy to define what we mean by these, or richer and poorer voters. And essentially for the vast majority, again, we do not see massive fracturing. So it's not that rich and poor Delhiites are very divided on what policy should be pursued or relatively privileged and disadvantaged caste groups are very fractured in what should be done about this problem. So where do we start seeing the bite then? If there is that kind of consensus, one of the places we do see a bite in the survey is that while there's broad support for environmental policies, the moment voters are made aware that those policies may incur personal costs for them, the, this support really wanes. So it's very shallow support. So what do I mean by that? For example, we ask voters, would you support more spending on environmental uh, 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 issues and in particular curbing air pollution? Almost 90% says, yes, we support more government spending on this. But when we add a very simple statement that this would be paid for by people like you paying more taxes, the support more than half to 47%. So it's a very, it's, it's very broad support, but very shallow support. Conversely, however, so there's this idea that the moment it starts hitting my pocketbook, I lose a lot of support for environmental policies. However, the reverse is also true, which is that priming the costs of air pollution can positively affect the support for costly mitigation action. So what do we mean by this? When we ask people, do you support the setting up of factories that generate employment in and around Delhi? 87% says, yes, we support that. But when we add the note that these factories will pollute the air, that support drops to 23%, even though these are employment generating factories. So we try to think through this idea that it's not just the personal costs of mitigation, which is often the focus in literature and public debate, but what if we made voters aware of the personal costs of the personal costs, not just the public costs, but the personal costs of air pollution? Could we then move the needle on public attitudes? And so that's the final part of the paper that uh, Shikhar will just talk about. So this motivated a, a kind of field intervention. Uh, and let me just briefly describe to you what we did. So uh, air quality reading machines that are portable, uh, cheap uh, at about $50 in price um, and, and scalable, which means they can be distributed, can provide you a reading of indoor air quality that is within your own drawing room, living room, uh, bedroom, where, where, where you inhabit spaces. And we believe that one of the kind of... Uh, uh, perceptions can be that air pollution is something you can close your window and doors on, that this is a problem of the outdoors, not indoors. But in fact, I think 
uh, it can be the case that outdoor air actually significantly affects the quality of air indoors. In fact, it, it does. And therefore, awareness about it uh, can significantly shape or should shape political salience. So what do we do? Uh, we essentially randomly assign half our respondents to, to see the air quality in an actual air quality meter at the start of the survey. And the enumerator essentially tells them that according to doctors and scientists, AQI should be under 50. Above 50 means the air is polluted and harmful to your health. And according to research, breathing polluting air can reduce lifespan by about five years. There are various estimates that go higher than that. We took the most conservative one. And currently the air here is, and a number, uh, that is X more than 50. So in this case, the AQI uh, in a hypothetical setting is 242. So it's 192 more than 50. And they show them the reading. The treatment group in this particular analysis, that is the random half that see the, the, the air quality first, then go on to take the survey. And the control group, on the other hand, first answer the survey and, and then are told about their uh, indoor air quality. Uh, what all of this means in practice is essentially that the treatment group is primed to think about air quality inside their own house, whereas the control group is only aware of this after they answer the question. So just two results that we'd like to uh, bring to your uh, attention, which suggests that this intervention was promising. On the left side, we ask an open-ended question to people, uh, which is what is the most important electoral issue uh, were elections to happen tomorrow? Uh, there's no priming, there is no uh, option choice. Whatever people say, we could re record a qualitative response. About 4% people in the control group think of air pollution as an important electoral issue. This is very much in line with the national election studies and CSDS data that we have uh, on this particular issue. However, in the, in the treatment group, when people see their indoor AQI, that number jumps to 19%. That's a 15 percentage point increase, which is significant. Uh, second, uh, as a kind of more behavioral measure, we partnered with local uh, 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 research, uh, we partnered with local uh, graphic designers to create two boat issue stickers that you can see on the right side of the screen. One of them basically says, uh, vote tabhi jab pradushan kam karoge. I will vote for you only when you reduce air pollution. And another says, vote tabhi jab diesel petrol ke dam kam karoge. When diesel or petrol prices are lower. So we're essentially pitting a question of fuel prices, which are actually emitting or pollution causing versus pollution reduction. And what we find uh, in the second panel here is about 76% people in the control group pick the air pollution stickers. So actually high support for air pollution behaviorally, uh, even absent our intervention. But there is a further four percentage points increase in picking the air pollution sticker over the diesel petrol prices sticker in the treatment group when people um, uh, that is citizens and voters uh, are given or reported the indoor air quality. In other words, a large attitudinal increase by about 15 percentage points and a four percentage point behavioral increase. Uh, with those words, I'll hand over to Tariq, but thank you so much for your time and, and for, uh, for going through our uh, findings. Yeah, I think we're happy to turn it over now to Jayashree and Bhargav. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Whoever, uh, Jayashree or Bhargav, whoever wants to start, you know, any comments, reflections, or things that you want to add to this conversation, and then we can come back. Yeah, so um, thank you for this, Tariq. This is a very interesting, Tariq and Shita, very interesting um, paper. Um, I've uh, been through the preprint uh, uh, piece, and uh, I agree, broadly agree with most of your findings, but I also think that uh, what matters electorally to people is often very disconnected from what also affects them personally. And this is particularly true for many environmental issues. Look at Uttarakhand, for example. Uh, the quality, the, the kind of planning in the Himalayan region is never uh, an electoral issue, but infrastructure would be an electoral issue, even though uh, you know the state has been affected by various disasters and they have been seeing climate impacts very clearly. So I guess the same kind of findings we would also see for a climate change uh, study if you have, if you were to do a similar study on climate change impacts. Um, I would just like to make a few points on <clears throat> what has happened in the past to give it uh, you know a bit of a context. 
I think that air pollution has been a public issue. I mean, it's not, uh, it, the politicians see that there is some kind of a pressure when air pollution levels go up. If you look at the 2014 WHO urban quality, uh, urban air quality database, which said that Delhi uh, is the most polluted city in the world, it immediately affected the political, uh, you know, uh, the politicians, the government, and they responded. Even some officials rejected the study, said that this is overestimating uh, the numbers and all of that. But soon after, in 2014, the air quality index was launched, which is uh, which sort of makes it very easy and accessible for people to understand uh, air quality numbers instead of looking at concentrations. Then uh, in 2016 and 2017, we saw some of the horrible, you know, very bad, severe air pollution episodes in Delhi where you could not see each other and smog was in your room and all of that. So even then, we noticed that right after that, there were responses from, uh, from the minister uh, saying that, no, we are trying to address this. And so clearly there is a perception that we need to address it because it affects people. But that has come after a very long campaign by the civil society. So are they responding to the civil society studies by introducing the graded response, emergency response? Now we have an emergency alert response system graded, uh, which is GRAP, where uh, whenever the levels go up, a certain kind of measures, emergency measures kick in. We also have a national air quality plan, uh, the NAMP, um, which which has targets uh, of reducing air pollution levels by 20 to 30 percent. And this year, 2024, is when uh, you know we are likely to review uh, whether the, that plan has been successful. But <clears throat> it, if you look at how uh, people, I mean, we do these vox pop interviews all the time as part of our reporting exercises. People understand air pollution very well. Um, there are street side vendors who have told us during smog episodes that ghutan ho rahi hai. We are not able to breathe and we really want to escape this. But it is episodic, you know. This goes up, this peak goes up in October, November. Again happens in January and often doesn't, uh, doesn't coincide with the election campaign period. I don't know what's going to happen this year, but it it doesn't coincide. I don't know whether that is a factor, but but it is also seen as a very complex issue. And on this, I completely agree with Tariq and Shikhar's uh, paper, is that whenever there is a peak, you will notice that the BJP supporters are saying that, oh, Ahmadi Party Punjab is doing this. And then they would say, oh, you're blaming the poor farmers, uh, you know, but what about the rich who are driving the cars uh, on Delhi's roads? So this this happens every year. But is it is it so important for the voters who has to determine how they would exercise um, franchises? I I don't see that. I, I mean, I honestly feel that uh, voting is determined more by things that may not personally affect them. And there have been, I mean, it does personally affect them, but on the levels of identity and, uh, you know, economic opportunities, infrastructure, having a developed city, developed country, uh, development parameters, but not so much education, health, um, you know, air pollution, general well well-being, uh, quality of life is also not something that I found to be very, very important to people, uh, very strangely. And <clears throat> I also feel that there is this feeling that it is a very complex problem to grasp. Uh, uh, they feel that, oh, industries are involved, but there are also farmers who need to be addressed, this double burning issue. And then there is this entire transport problem. So somewhere there's also this mental block that perhaps this may not be, uh, you know, very easy to resolve. So those are my, uh, you know, few comments. And, um, and also, uh, you know, this something I wanted to add that how we are reviewing whether air pollution levels are coming down or not also determines what voters think. Unless you actually show them that something works, you know, that there is a place where we have managed to reduce the air pollution levels by uh, this benchmark, and now your this is how your quality of life has improved. Uh, it's perhaps very difficult um, 
to you know sort of to influence uh, their voting uh, practices and um, this is particularly true for the national air quality uh, namp uh, which is being currently being uh, implemented in 131 cities um, if we do not know whether the pm 2.5 levels are actually coming down i don't see how it would become an electoral issue so thank you for this yeah i would like to listen to bhargav now Thank you, Jaisi. Thanks so much, Tariq. Uh, Shikhar, excellent presentation. I, I had the opportunity to read the paper when it first came out, and I think there were a few reflections that I sort of carried through the first reading and then watching you present it again this time. I think there's a, there's a few interesting things that have come out from your survey, right? I think the first is that um, most people don't necessarily make the connection that air pollution that they experience on a daily basis is also connected in many ways to the ways that they experience interaction with the state. So one of the things that you guys um, talk about in the same panel simultaneously pitching the same question is about garbage and sewage being an issue versus air pollution being an issue. A big source of local air pollution in Delhi is the fact that uh, horticultural waste isn't collected, isn't composted, and so it's burned on site. And there's so much other trash that is burned on site in Delhi that produces a significant amount of air pollution. In similar ways, most ways that people experience air pollution is through the, the sort of construction dust that is produced through large-scale construction projects, primarily led by the state, which is, which is all across the city, right? Whether it be construction of metro, whether it be construction of large government offices, whether it be the digging up of roads for laying relaying of cables whatever it may be water pipes all of those things cause air pollution as well right so there's a there's a way in which air pollution intersects with people's daily lives in a way i think that's complex to capture when you're talking about air pollution as this sort of monolith the the second thing is i was i was pleasantly surprised by the fact that farmers figured so low in the in the blame game in this in this particular survey because i think if you look at the way the media covers it the, the crescendo of media coverage around air pollution really hits during during farmer season and you can see the stubble burning season and the the disproportionate coverage um, of of uh, stubble burning as an issue if you, if you look at its annual contribution to air pollution is less than five percent of Delhi's annual contribution to air pollution right similar to the number of people that act, the proportion of people that actually consider farmers to blame in your survey uh, but the disproportionate coverage of that really masks the fact that there are a plurality of sources in Delhi that require addressing locally um, and I think the third is that there's this um, there's this perception that challenging political decisions are hard to implement without uh, public consensus. And I think there are two things that stood out for me in your in your survey that I think really reflect that that isn't the case, right? That political will will often have to precede uh, public consensus. So the limits on on car ownership, for instance, um, less than less than 10 percent of the city owns cars um, and the, the less than 10 percent of the city that owns cars effectively dictates infrastructure development within the city. And the fact that a, a sizable proportion of your survey respondents were in favor of limiting car use or car ownership was a was an important one. And the second is the ban on diesel diesel vehicles. I think that was seen as a particularly contentious decision at that point in time because you have a large taxi fleet that's primarily diesel. Uh, many, many uh, private vehicle owners chose diesel for high fuel efficiency and things like that. But now it's, it seemingly has received uh, public acceptance in a way, which which I didn't really foresee at that point in time. But it's, I'm happy to see that that is the case now. Um, but And the last one I wanted to sort of challenge a little bit is this idea that there is this general uh, notion, right, that uh, addressing environmental issues will necessarily mean that you have declines in economic growth or and or uh, increases in taxation. Um, just to put it into context, I mean, the amount of money that we spend on air pollution every year, large programs on air pollution only, not talking about sort of uh, smaller things that happen. Uh, last year, for instance, there's about 30, 3,500 crores that were spent on, on uh, the issue of stubble burning for provision of equipment and various other things. And about 4,400 crores between 2019 and 2024 have been allocated both under the National Clean Air Program that uh, Jeshri referred to, as well as the 15th Finance Commission, which specifically provided air quality grants to 40 cities. Now, the sum of these two together is still orders of magnitude lower than what subsidies are provided for, for coal and other fossil fuels, uh, which people directly benefit from in many ways. Farmers benefit from free electricity for pump sets. Uh, people benefit from lower electricity prices. And so much of it is is sort of resting in the in the financial viability of the the electricity sector in a way, partly because you're you're sort of layering all of this debt onto state governments as well as in some cases the union government. So uh, it's not that taxation 
is is a is necessarily a bad thing. I think the the quantum of taxation that we're talking about is really sort of minuscule compared to what other subsidies are already being provided for for basic goods and services that people experience, right? Um, so these are sort of some uh, thoughts that I had from the presentation itself. I think one thing I did want to point out is that we have excessively urbanized the conversation on air pollution in India. There have been there have been, I mean, we can talk about the fact that uh, there are 132 cities which are covered under the National Clean Air Program, which have set targets of 20 to 30 percent improvement in air quality by 2024, 30, 40 to 50 percent improvement by 2026 and whatnot. But the same air pollution that you and I experience in the city is experienced by every other person living in the indo mm -hmm. plane. Uh, and in many other parts of India, we've seen most other parts of the country experiencing high levels of air pollution this year as well. So the the problem is far more peri-urban and rural than it is an urban problem. But we have excessively urbanized the conversation around it for sure. The I will say the one successful political platform that arose out of uh, sort of the air pollution issue uh, was actually the Pradhan Mantri Ujjala Yojana, which um, mm. was a program to provide uh, free gas connections and cylinders to, to rural households. 90 million odd households were provided new connections as well as some subsidized cylinders and some free cylinders. That subsidy keeps getting rolled back and brought in during election periods and whatnot. But that, while it was not necessarily pitched as an air pollution intervention, addressed possibly uh, a source that contributes for third, a third of the air pollution loading all around the country which is uh, un, um, sort of polluting fuels used for cooking and heating within the home. Mm -hmm. um, but that that program became really a, a platform for electoral success uh, in 2017. It was launched in 2016 in Uttar Pradesh in advance of the, the 2017 elections there. Balia was the, the site that it was launched and the, the program rolled out through UP first before it went to the rest of the country, right? And, and it was cited as a reason for electoral success. You could see every uh, petrol, petrol station in the country had a had a PMUY uh, banner plastered somewhere or the other, right? So it's certainly a thing where Perhaps we haven't done a good enough job of of bringing air pollution as an as a sort of monolithic issue into how it interacts with citizens' day to day lives, and perhaps doing that through such vehicles is something that we should be thinking about much more deeply. Uh, okay. So that's just some early thoughts as we go through this conversation. And I just wanted to I just remembered something that I've done a story on the manifestos uh, in 2019, and I think uh, Ahmadmi Party and BJP both referred to air pollution as one of the very minuscule uh, minor uh, thing in the environment section, but it, they did mention, and I, as far as I remember, they did promise a 35% reduction in air pollution levels in the mission cities, you know, where, where air pollution control will be um, done in a mission mode. So uh, the fact that it finds a place, at least even if it, uh, it's a cursory mention in uh, manifestos of political parties uh, is... I think is a it gives us hope that there is uh, this sense that it is a public issue, but from the people's side, there is not enough uh, you know ask or demand for uh, you know sort of uh, delivering months. It was also in all three parties manifestos in 2014. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we actually went backwards <laughs> one step there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Jayashree and Bhargav. Uh, Tarik and Chikhar, would you like to respond, reflect? Uh, or do you want to take questions? I know there are there are quite a few questions, but maybe just a couple. I mean, first of all, the, that's very helpful feedback from both Jayashree and Bhargav. Thank you guys so much for first of all uh, reading the paper uh, and also for um, for listening and, and giving your reflections. And I think uh, broadly agree with a lot of what you're saying, but maybe just a couple of things to kind of contextualize um, what we're doing. I, I won't go through all, and if Shikhar has a couple of points too, and then we can open it up. I think Jeshi, you're absolutely right um, that you know, um, uh, in some ways, what we are trying to uh, look at, and I think it's you know, you know, kind of interesting to see that it's not that there's no response from political actors, but I think it's episodic. It's kind of crisis driven. So even the seasonality of response. I mean, we know that air pollution in Delhi for the vast majority of the year is you know, multiple times what the WHO limit is. Right? Even in our survey, we actually deliberately did it at a non-high air pollution time, and we were still getting an average AQI reading of 150. So uh, you know, we've also normalized. I mean, even now when I'm in Delhi, people say in December that 400 is not so bad because they've experienced you know 500 during or 600 during uh, um, uh, during Diwali, and so I think that normalization uh, is also quite interesting. Also, if we zoom out from India, 
um, and think of other experience of other, you know, other countries have gone through massive periods of air pollution and not just in, you know, Western Europe, but Japan, Mexico, Mexico City for a long time was a heavily air polluted city. And in those contexts, we did see evidence of public mobilization, both around elections and around protests that I agree there's some civil society action, especially in a place like Delhi, where there's kind of well embedded civil society actors, but by relative standards, it's really not I mean, it's not that nobody is doing anything, but by relative standards, the kind of volume that we see, including among the public. So this idea that, you know, the development is going to matter, so people are not going to care about this. Well, in, you know, a context like Mexico, it wasn't that these were, you know, very wealthy voters, and they were still recognizing and reacting to this. And the second point is exactly what you said, you know, when we went and interviewed uh, people in Delhi, uh, and, you know, you gave the example of Guten over a year, right? So it isn't that people aren't aware that this is like directly impacting, you know, and typically on that, we might see some conversion. And if not, why is that not converting to the level that political parties are putting it as a minor issue in their manifesto or they're kind of episodically in the moment saying, okay, we're now going to have this emergency action for when it hits 500 AQI or 450 AQI, we're going to close schools. And one of the interesting things about air pollution is, you know, an issue like that or an action like that actually affects so many residents, right? It's not just affecting you. We could even understand if it only affects, I mean, this is actually one of the issues that does affect the rich, maybe less so than the poor, but it's something that the rich can't fully inoculate themselves from, or they can't fully inoculate their children from. And so again, you would think there'd be some kind of uh, movement on this. And so I think a couple of things that we thought this brush clearing exercise would be useful for was going around and even talking to Delhi residents. There are a lot of armchair theories. So we did hear from certain Delhiites that other kinds of Delhiites don't know or care about this. So we heard from poor Delhiites that rich people don't care about this. We heard from rich Delhiites that poor Delhiites don't know about this. They're not informed about this. None of that seems to be true. We also heard that people aren't going to agree on things. And this exactly this hidden consensus on, say, a one car limit, because the truth is most Delhiites do not own cars, but mm -hmm. less less um, uh, appetite for banning diesel bikes, because many, many people do own bikes, um, even showing where the more places are for some kind of consensus building, we thought would be a useful kind of exercise on this. The other point I'll make, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Shikhar, which is that I think um, this uh, point about, um, you know, uh, do people not care about their quality of life? I think to some degree that may be true, but I think one of the more interesting parts of the survey for me was that even when people perceive this trade-off, it's not always that they're going to pick development over the environment. And if, if, there, if there is a, a kind of mindset to that, maybe there's a mismatch with understanding and explaining to them, and this is the point that Bhargav made, we don't mean to imply that we believe there is a trade-off. Because in fact, this idea that there's a trade-off between de development and, and environmental issues is itself being pushed back on. But we are saying that even though right now that message has not been received, even when people do think that there's this kind of trade-off, they might be willing to kind of go against developmental interests. And we just found that to be descriptively interesting. But you're right, that is obviously still something that's kind of blocking that translation into political action. Um, Shikhar, I don't know if you have something you wanted to add on that, just, um, include, on the point on PM uh, uh, Ujwala Yojana or something else that, that you had since you studied that scheme. I, just three, uh, uh, you know, additional reflections to what Tariq has said, all of which I, 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 I completely agree with. I think um, Jeshi's point about uh, how do we measure improvement? Um, and I think these days, uh, a lot of political salience uh, of issues come from showing a model of success. Uh, pe hota hai, hota hai, hota hai. I think uh, a lot of our future uh, focus is going, also going to engage with uh, with something like that. Uh, and and if and where, uh, where, where that may emerge. Uh, I, I think the question on uh, on the order of magnitudes of difference that Bhargav makes between fertilizer and coal subsidies on the one side and spending on air pollution is important and well taken. And in fact, I think future interventions can look at presenting people with allocation rules, like how much do you apportion between A and B rather than necessarily saying how much more we will take from you or maybe both. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and I think uh, there is fiscal space currently uh, and in a growing economy increasingly to do both things uh, and, and maybe change the mix or priority that we accord to the two of them. Uh, and I think how voters respond to that, which is fixing the 
total net burden on them, but how existing money is moved around between schemes and projects and priorities is, is something worth exploring further. And then finally, I think on the uh, on the broader urban urbanization of this point, uh, I think our next round of work is precisely targeted uh, at you know basically covering this as a problem that afflicts everybody in the Indo-Gangetic plain. Uh, and and to that end, actually, it's not even clear whether some of the findings from Delhi, which is an urban uh, uh, electorate, uh, even translate uh, to smaller towns, uh, areas that we study, or even rural areas. Uh, and and government interventions of the kind, including Ujwala uh, uh, or Har Ghar uh, Nal Ka Jal, I think these have implications for local kind of uh, ecological and environmental efforts that we'd be closely watching and, and evaluating in those surveys. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tariq and Shikhar. Uh, uh, someone asked me for the link of the paper, so I posted it on chat box, hopefully... Uh, uh, people in audience can access that uh, paper. Uh, if not, do let me know and we'll find other ways to put it on Q&A box. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, if if anyone has any question, comments, please put it on Q&A box. Tariq and Shikhar, I'll request you if you want to respond, some of them uh, there that would be useful. But now let me bring uh, Bhargav and Jayashree for a couple of questions. Uh, and then again, Tariq and Shikhar. But now I, I just want to sort of like also start zooming out from the air pollution conversation, but uh, to uh, Bhargav, uh, since you've been part of some of the conversations uh, with, with politicians who have been, you know, uh, uh, have a group which has been discussing on pollution and environmental issues. I also remember uh, our uh, former colleague, uh, Santosh Harish, who seems to be like he was here in the audience, uh, wrote a paper looking at uh, the kind of, uh, not just a number of questions that was asked on air pollution in last two decades, and uh, also uh, the kind of conversation that was taking place within the parliament uh, on air pollution. So he found that uh, perhaps between 2000 and 2010, uh, the average like was very, very low, but uh, post 2016, I think in those three years, the number of questions that were asked were uh, more than uh, 200. And there was, a, uh, uh, I think, some point in 2019, there was a seven hour long discussion on uh, uh, some of these things. So how is sort of like conversation on air pollution evolving between politicians? And is there a difference among uh, the parties, especially since Tariq and uh, uh, Shikhar pointed out to these kind of parties and lenses people have is there a partisan fight taking place there or there is some sort of like consensus that we need to figure out things? It's just hard. Thanks, Rahul. I think um, I'll just quickly refer to Santosh and, and our other colleagues' paper, right, which is called Airing Differences. It's a very interesting paper analyzing uh, parliamentary questions on, on air pollution, both in Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha between 2000 and, and 2019. I think you touched on one point, which is the, the fact that uh, parliamentary questions on air pollution the increase was almost tenfold between 2000 to 2005 and 2016 to 2019, uh, reflecting the fact that media coverage increased substantially post, say, 2013, 2014, right? I think the second point that I would like to make with respect to that report was the how closely the, the kinds of questions politicians asked really mirrored how media covered the issue, right? So the two sectors, for instance, that were the, the received the greatest focus um, as, as part of the analysis was vehicular pollution and, and crop residue burning. These were the predominantly the two sources that uh, politicians who were asking questions, the members of parliament who were asking questions in of the environment minister and others uh, were citing in their in their questions. Are, are there actions being taken to address these issues? Um, most of the other stuff received maybe one or two, maybe a handful of uh, questions uh, from parliamentarians. And in some ways, the conversation has evolved because in the in the time since, um, say, 2019 or so, there's a new parliamentarians group on clean air that has been set up. It's a cross-party group co-chaired by a, a, an MP from the Congress and an MP from the BJP. Um, but conversations haven't substantially evolved in the in the content of them. I think there's still a lot of talk about how air pollution is an issue, but there is still substantial focus even within this group on how air pollution is a is a Delhi 
Delhi really, really a Delhi focused issue to an extent. Uh, when you talk about air pollution in rural areas, most of them really don't recognize it being a problem, uh, especially parliament areas from rural districts, for instance, don't even recognize uh, for a large part that air pollution could be a problem in rural areas. They talk about how we need to go back to a way of living in uh, as we did back in the day in rural areas, look how we are so close to nature and how we live our lives in a particular way that doesn't really generate pollution in these areas. But then you go and look inside the homes of, of rural households and you see these polluting stoves living there, right? Um, and there's a sort of inordinate focus on on sort of performative actions like planting trees. Uh, we know from we know from experience and from the science that planting trees do little to nothing to really reduce substantial air pollution. Uh, but planting trees feature still as like a big issue that most parliamentarians would like to talk about uh, as a problem and as a solution to to a really complex problem. Um, where I where I am seeing sort of growing interest in the subject is the fact that I think the first convening of that group had three MPs attending, including the two co-chairs. And I think the last meeting that they had that I had an opportunity to present at, there was some 39 odd MPs. So there's a there's a substantial growth in growth in attendance and interest in the issue, right? And from MPs all across the country, not just MPs from say the IGP or from from this particular region of the country. So there's certainly growing awareness, but I think there's a there's a little bit of a chicken and egg kind of situation where constituent demand needs to really drive uh, parliamentarian interest on some of these issues, uh, and that demand really isn't there. And there is there's perhaps some work that we can do as as sort of advocates and communicators and scientists in this area on highlighting areas where MPs can have uh, potentially impactful interventions in their districts, but also how the media covers it really influences how MPs think about it. So if media, if, if, if for 100 stories, 35 are on, on drop burning, 30 are on vehicular emissions, 10 are on smog towers, then those are the questions that they're going to be asking because that's what they cite when they, when they talk about it in parliament as well. Hmm. Great. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Bhargav. Uh, Jeshri, if I can bring you in and, uh, you know, uh, think a little bit about uh, the voter side of the story. Uh, and so I understand, like, one of the reasons why I study perhaps elections or voting, because I think studying voting is very, very complicated. And the reason it's complex is because the act of vote is one, and the voter has to think of, like, hundreds of things. Uh, 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 right, uh, they have to think about their identity and things they might care about this on the social and cultural side, but also economic side. And then uh, uh, you have like environmental side. Of course, it's all linked in some ways, uh, uh, but they have to think too many things at one point of time to be able to arrive what uh, uh, that one vote is going to be and to whom. Uh, but is there any conversation taking place? Forget about like, it's not into... Uh, uh, turning into vote at the moment, uh, but is there a conversation on the ground among voters on the question of not just air pollution, uh, but things like, uh, you know, clean uh, roads, uh, uh, garbage being uh, sort of like taken uh, 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 at a time and uh, the Nali should be clean and, you know, so I'm, I'm just like what you'll call as issues of cleanliness, hygiene, uh, uh, are they part of like conversation or as we keep hearing, there are certain terms which I keep hearing and most of you must have heard, like three or four terms are common across the country, especially in the Hindi heartland. Bikas mm -hmm. uh, 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 right? Mehngai uh, baut bad gai hai and prashtachar bad gaya hai and then berozgari, right? Like is, the, like, is there a conversation um, like other than these four things? Or does the term Vikas also contains uh, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like the other things become subset of, of, of Vikas. Yeah. It's a large encompassing word. So when it comes to voting, I, I haven't heard this issue being discussed or even issues related to air pollution being discussed that much. For that matter, even climate change being discussed as an as an electoral issue, no, I haven't heard. And we do this very often just to see what's, you know, what's going on, what is the public sentiment like, but it is completely determined by something else altogether at the moment. I mean, that's my understanding. But if you if you had to interview people who are really affected, if you look at the priority that people give to air pollution or issues related to air pollution, I think the best people to interview would be 
people who have compromised health because uh, as part of the health team, we have also interviewed many, many doctors and uh, even personally, I mean, I just have friends who are doctors and I have asked them whether you see a change or whether you're seeing, uh, you know, an escalation in diseases related to air pollution. And it, there is a very, very clear connection between the two, even during this month when we had uh, this, you know, two weeks of smog and fog episode, they clearly saw a peak. Hmm. If you were to ask the same question to a person probably suffering pneumonia, bronchitis, uh, lung issue, cardiac issue, you would get a totally different uh, sort of an answer. So so priorities uh, matter. I mean, uh, what stage they are in in their lives and what is affecting them. And this issue, if you were to ask a farmer in Punjab, you would get a totally different answer because the concerns that are impacting them the electoral issues are obviously not air pollution i mean the fact that uh, you see stubble burning itself is caused by a very complex problem that they're stuck in and are not able to come out of it so there's debt there is pest heavy dependence on pesticide there is no groundwater uh, they, it is a total mess. Uh, if you have done several ground reports uh, from Punjab and Haryana and seen the similar situation there. So if you were to ask, is environment a big problem? They would say no, but I first want to get out of my debt. So clearly, you know, money would be more important to me. So, I mean, it's. Uh, I think it depends on where people are. But no, I haven't heard anybody discussing this. I've only heard sometimes... If you go closer to environment, the only electoral issue that I have heard uh, people discussing is forest rights, for example, or land rights. Mm. Because land itself is, uh, you know, is something that is very, very important. And that plays the dynamics in local politics and how people uh, vote. So th that is the closest that they go to environment. Uh, but... If you talk to them in general for everyday life, clearly environment and air pollution are very big issues, which they say indirectly, if you, when there is a smog episode, you go and interview anybody on the road, anybody, I mean, rich, poor, whatever, if you're doing a walk spot, they will, the first thing they'll tell you is, this is what that I, this is what I want to escape. So time and priority and who you're, who you're asking is, what perhaps matters but no this time it's not it's not something that i have seen at all uh, being discussed okay thank thank you jashree uh tarik and shikha there are a couple of questions uh, on q a box so you can answer them uh but i uh, uh you know there's one question which is related to about whether the findings and the uh, question that you pose here would travel to other contexts since delhi is a special mm -hmm. case uh, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, something which I wanted to ask you, uh, really, since the like big picture finding of this paper in the first part is about uh, partisan blame, right? Like the supporters of BJP see it as a problem, and supporters of AAP see this as a BJP government not doing enough. Uh, do you think now we are at a phase in Indian politics uh, where? what one would call as issue rationalization is happening. You have already chosen sites and you are basically going to blame the other party or the government uh, for it rather than your own. And this sort of like partisan uh, divide mm -hmm. uh, is uh, going to play a role on other things as well on the question of unemployment or uh, any other such issue. Yeah, maybe just starting on the the last question, uh, Rahul. So I think, um, you know, that that's it's an important question, and I think we are inclined to think that that is likely to be the case. That is that we think that, uh, and Shikhar can um, can chime in if, um, but uh, on on this, if he has something additional to say. But one of the striking things we found about this was that precisely because yes, parties may blame each other, etc., but precisely because this is not the most important issue for either party in this context nor is it an issue on which we have a clear partisan divide. So it's not like in the US where environment clearly di di you know, divides the two major parties in terms of their entire viewpoint on what needs to be done about this issue. And yet we actually find the partisan effects in our 
survey uh, are about uh, three times the effect that uh, U.S. pandemic evaluations, which were highly partisan um, and a highly partisan issue, um, in a context in which partisan identity is meant to lead everything. So in the U.S., the idea is, you know, you have your party ID, you have the party you support, and that really uh, informs your view on a range of issues. In India, historically, as you know, the strength of partisan attachment, that deeply held party partisanship has not been always seen to be the case. Yeah. And so uh, I think, and you know, I'd be interested for your take on this too, but I think we're beginning to see evidence that that is changing, at least in certain contexts. And certainly in the Delhi context, and this relates to your first question, I don't know how much this partisanship can be, would be replicated elsewhere, but mm. I think it's pretty instructive that we find uh, the, this size of an effect um, on an issue on which the parties, they may, you know, badmouth each other as they do on every other issue, but it's not what I would say is the heart of their partisan differences. And yet we see voters. So I think that does speak to the idea that voters may be developing these partisan attachments that kind of lead their view on a topic. Um, and if so, that, you know, that may have uh, real implications for accountability. Because mm -hmm. even if you decide that you want to hold political actors accountable, if you're selectively blaming and rewarding them based on your pa underlying partisanship, as mm -hmm. we said before, that really skews incentives for pol political politicians to feel these accountability pressures because you can mm. raise the questions and whatever but if you know that any attack i face my my supporters will never leave me because they i can quickly deflect it onto the other party and vice versa mm. um it's very hard to ever see that those accountability pressures even germinating even if voters are informed even if they hold government responsible even if they think that this is just as important as development so i do think that that's kind of an important setting on how generalizable this is I really, we don't know. And yeah. I mean, I think we picked it in, we picked Delhi in many ways because we thought if it's going to be salient anywhere, the conditions are ripest here, mm. uh, right? And so we tried to make it a difficult case to see, uh, will this matter here? But maybe we're wrong about that. You know, maybe we'll find that in small towns, actually people are, uh, you know, much more willing to hold. We don't know. I mean, in some ways, we were surprised by the lack of public opinion data on this question, you know, other than a stray question here or there. At least we have not been able to find any other study of public opinion squarely on this issue in an urban or rural setting or peri-urban setting. So right now, I think we just need to build some basic mapping of people's views on this. And again, we may also say even in Delhi, maybe your view on air pollution is very different than any other environmental issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then, so there's a spatial dimension, there's a topical dimension, and that speaks to the need for much more data collection on all of those dimensions for a mapping of environmental public opinion. All the issues Jeshi was raising, I thought the Uttarakhand point is a great one, mm -hmm. uh, right? But do we actually have any public opinion studies of Uttarakhand residents, how they think of landslides, how they think of the relationship between infrastructure and what they're facing? We, we don't. So. Uh, I think it really opens up more questions and answers at this stage. Okay. Uh, just to add, not add, but one more question, which is uh, now I'm uh, uh, sort of like intrigued that uh, partisanship levels in Delhi are high because I can understand partisanship levels for BJP are high since BJP has been there for a very, very long period of time. But if there mm -hmm. are people who have become our partisan, what does that mean? In, in fact, for the study of partisanship that within a span of 10 years, a party has been able to develop such strong attachments. Uh, yeah. So, Shikhar, you wanted to... Sorry, I was going to answer that question, but Tariq, you can go first. No, no, go for it. I was, I was waiting to you. Yeah, go ahead. So, I think, uh, uh, actually, the one thing I wanted to point out, um, just to, uh, in addition to what Tariq was saying, was that the what we find in Delhi vis-a-vis -vis partisanship is actually increasingly a global characterization of democratic politics. Um, this is not a India specific kind of, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, analysis, uh, certainly we would have reason to believe it should not happen in India, but it is happening elsewhere. And so if we look at, for example, the U S, uh, there was a period in U S politics where there was a frequent term of asymmetric polarization that people in one party are polarized, whereas those in the other are not. And I think as these kind of polarizations entrench, that is people's and voters, uh, partisan affiliations strengthen. Sometimes they can be stronger in one particular camp over another, uh, but often there is a reaction, action reaction, a kind of between a uh, dynamic between two different uh, uh, actors that can strengthen or fortify uh, group identities over a period of time. 
And I think that is uh, that is something to watch out for even in the Delhi case, that uh, it, it may not start off with a strong partisan identity in one particular among subset of one particular voters, but uh, as the issue does get or evoke selective blaming on on one side, it can it can create uh, the conditions for there to be a similar way of processing information and viewing performance on the other side. Okay, thank you, thank you, Shikhar. Uh, let me uh, bring in uh, both uh, Bhargav and Jashri, uh, uh, and and we are now towards the closer of our conversation. Uh, so I, I think we all agree that voters uh, and politicians both are aware of this issue, right? But perhaps what might not be happening, uh, and this is uh, again zooming out, is that sometimes it's become difficult for politicians to find a language of communication, right? So, so you know that this is an issue, uh, but you have to basically find the vocabulary on which voters are able to understand, right? What you, uh, like in political communication literatures, you'll call it sort of like framing or creating that mental maps and structures, right? So why are some leaders more effective uh, than others? Because they find ways to say the same thing in a very, very different way. Like I think uh, we all like would, like Kanshi Ram's way of telling, uh, using that the pen example of 85 versus 15 was very, very effective. Right. So, Bhargo, what you were saying that uh, perhaps while the size of the uh, 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 group of politicians who are thinking about this has has grown, the conversation has largely remained the same, uh, even within them. Uh, and so, one, they are not able to communicate or find the vocabulary or language to, uh, you know, start a small segment like or create a uh, uh, sort of like a small segment of voters who first care. And from there, voters, the voter demand does not uh, get created in vacuum. There has to be something also from elite side happening and uh, uh, elite, I mean, political elite side that more and more voters start caring about. And then once you have uh, a ground swell, then it, this could become a, a point of mobilization. So my sort of like what I'm asking uh, you, Bhargo, because you also said that perhaps researchers and journalists and civil society, like what kind of things that we could do for this issue uh, uh, to gain more traction or perhaps politicians uh, uh, manage to develop uh, that language or we can't do much, we can keep writing uh, where we write, but uh, like someday some politician would figure out on their own. It's a challenging one to answer, right? Because I don't think there's a, I mean, if you're, if you're talking about air pollution in, in any part of this country, you're looking at four, five, six different sources that are contributing to air pollution. Addressing most of those sources is not a, is not a sexy issue. Uh, working on air pollution is a largely unsexy issue, looking at how the state is functioning, how institutions work, and whether they're capable of executing on their basic mandate. And we know from work that we have published as well at CPR on, on pollution control boards, for instance, that they are ill-functioning institutions for the most part. Uh, where it has been successful in gaining traction is where there are these sort of big bang announcements related to um, sort of linking air pollution to some kind of development or welfare related activity or scheme, right? So the, I referred to the Pradhan Mantri Ochoala Yojana before, partly because it has been largely the only successful intervention on air pollution side. How successful it has been with re respect to reducing air pollution within those households remains to be seen, but as a program, uh, that was delivered to the population, primarily on the basis of, of sort of two messages, right? One is this idea of improving the dignity of, of rural households and women in particular. And the second being the, the fact that uh, a less polluted kitchen means a, a healthier home and a healthier household and family. Those were sort of the two primary messages of that program. And that program gained traction largely because of that, especially amongst women voters. Hmm. So there's, there's probably a greater onus on us to find entry points for, say, interventions related to, say, specific sectoral actions that have the possibility of garnering political traction in some way, right? I don't think we do a good job of that right now. Um, for instance, any part, political party in Delhi, uh, in their manifesto, I think uh, Jeshri referred to it earlier, right? It went from three in 2014 to uh, two in 2019. Everyone mentions the fact that increasing bus availability and increasing the bus fleet in Delhi is like a big focus of all of the political parties. Well, between 2014 and 2019, the bus fleet was still flat. From mm -hmm. 2019 onwards, the bus fleet has increased by about 2,000 to 3,000 odd buses. 
the majority of Delhi citizens travel by bus. And this is perhaps where the partisanship could also come from because you're talking about um, a very large percentage of the population that relies on public transport, but investments aren't really going there. Investments are going in other places, right? Mm -hmm. So the question of how do you how do you pitch it as a, as a welfare, as a quality of life improvement for the people who are largely voting for you is a challenge that perhaps politicians haven't done well to, to crystallize for themselves, right. but also we haven't done well in communicating it to them. Uh, thanks, Bhargav. Uh, Jeshti, you have anything to add uh, to this point? Uh, to oh, I just uh, I just remembered that sometimes uh, naming and shaming also seems to work. Uh, I mean, when uh, when ambassadors, diplomats uh, start leaving, I remember there was a lot of uh, oh. you know sort of response, and they said that it was kind of we felt that there was a sense of embarrassment, and also that that uh, you know they are rea overreacting, and that we. But at the same time, they responded and, you know, did something about it. So, um, I mean, now there's a lot of conversation about develop, developed country, from developing country to developed country. How would you actually become a developed country if your uh, air quality is not even meeting, forget the WHO standard, but your own national standard? So conversations like that, I'm just, I mean, thinking aloud, maybe, uh, you know, at some point would work. And especially the China example can be quite sensitive and, uh, you know, uh, since it has really worked for them, if we go by their data mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, so, so, you know, things like that can, can work and, you know, basically looking at how air pollution is actually a development uh, and infrastructure issue and not, you know, against development. So that kind of conversation may be helpful just thinking aloud yeah uh, just if i can I, just add to that quickly yeah, Rahul, i think there is also one aspect of the the china story that we don't really talk about right which is that i think with uh, how china addressed air pollution required a lot of uh, work on behind the scenes stuff so whether it be reducing air pollution from from thermal power plants uh, regulating industrial emissions across the board or vehicular emissions uh, that unsexy stuff really did happen in the background. What we've taken as a lesson from that is looking at the performative governance aspects of this and seeing that those are the things that are successful, which is why you end up with perhaps things like uh, outdoor air purification or smog towers, for instance, right? So mm -hmm. put it into context, you know, smog tower costs some 22 crores. The Delhi Pollution Control Committee's uh, annual expenditure is around 24 crores. So this the uh, this is the kind of mismatch in, in prioritization that we're talking about, right? I think we look at performative aspects far more than we do the institutional aspects, which is kind of the, the bread and butter of CPR, but perhaps we, we need to think about how to make those issues much more salient. Thank you, uh, Bhargav. Uh, yes, it used to be bread and butter issue of CPR, but we'll figure that out. Anyways, uh, Tariq, just to end this uh, with you, last question, uh, uh, you know, uh, between parties and voters, uh, civil societies should play some role in, in electoral democracies and especially like uh, on issues because they can see. So we think of politicians and, par par uh, and parties a little bit short-sighted in terms of like they are basically focusing on the next election where civil societies could focus on issues that will have a long-term uh, cost, right? And And... And this is also related to uh, the experimental work you did. Like, if civil societies also start talking rather than the, like, you know, air pollution hurting you, but if they start putting this as in the context that now your child's age is like, you know, they are mm -hmm. 10 years less likely to uh, mm -hmm. live because of the air pollution, because I think now uh, some uh, doctors and uh, researchers have started suggesting that in Delhi, uh, the average age is going to get reduced by 10 or 12 years. I don't know how uh, mm -hmm. true that is. And and uh, uh, basically yeah, adults, uh, not adults, like small children have started developing respiratory issues. So most of them are visiting doctors because of respiratory issues. Like, do you think that kind of civil society mobilization would be more helpful? One. And two, why is civil society missing in actions? You, like your first slide showed that there are no protests. So any reflections on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, we don't have a systematic answer to why civil society is not mobilizing more. I think one of the things that was interesting to me and perhaps Shikhar when we've been talking about this um, in Delhi is that 
uh, a lot of Delhiites are under the perception that civil society is very active because they know of a group or a collective that has raised this issue. And I don't want to belittle that as an effort. Yeah. Yeah. But even in the Chinese context, which is a much, uh, you know, much more challenging context for such actions, there were large scale protests on air pollution and often creative protests. There are also studies that show that during high pollution times in China, there was real uh, dips in public opinion satisfaction with the um, with the government. And so uh, and there was civil society activism that was far more mobilized and I think publicly visible. One thing that might be the case is that there's a little bit of fracturing of civil society's understanding of the public and what the problem is. So civil society could either directly target politicians with certain actions, and I think Bhargav has been talking some, about some of this, or they could be trying to mobilize public sentiment, I mean, and, and show that there is strength in kind of numbers in order to be able to create some kind of political pressure. But in order to do the latter, I think civil society perhaps needs a better reading of where exactly the public opinion challenge is. I mean, even where we are talking today, even this conversation that we've had, I, I've talked to lots of people who think, well, people think this fatalism point was very pervasive, that, that, that Delhiites don't think anything can be done. So if you believe the average Delhiite is fatalistic about this, then perhaps you don't think that mobilizing them is the best route for a civil society organization to take. But is that actually the case? So to the degree that this one paper suggests anything, and it's just one paper, um, it suggests that we maybe need to first understand public sentiment, go out and the things like what Jayashree has been doing, uh, actually going and talking to people and getting a composite picture of where public opinion is, what might be the most effective way to harness that opinion. That might be a more grassroots approach of kind of building civil society action. I think right now it's been a kind of more uh, perhaps elite dominated and technocratic effort than one that really seeks to understand what the challenges are uh, and to link it to those challenges as both Bhargav and Jayashree I think have done, you know, linking it to buses, linking it to kind of household benefits and some of the things that we think maybe people may be more mobilized about. Okay. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, uh, Shikhar, you want to add anything before uh, we close? Thank you. No. No, thank uh, Rahul, you. I, I, just want, I just want to add something. Uh, you know, this time, the school closures, uh, because of air pollution, you would think that that's a minor yeah. issue, but that cut into the winter vacation for children. And mm. that seemed to affect a lot of parents. And there, was, there, there were a lot of conversations about how air pollution every year is eating into the winter vacation period and also impacting daily routine routines of children. I mean, these are something that we don't generally discuss. But if you look at how people are responding to it, these are things that matter to them because, uh, you know, they don't want their children's routine disrupted and things like that. So just, just wanted to add this as an aside here. No, absolutely. You are right about this. I think uh, even uh, some, uh, especially private universities have started uh, discussing that the midterm break uh, should be aligned with uh, when the pollution levels are high, uh, 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 rather than, you know, at any point of uh, the time. And I, I think a couple of uh, places actually held online classes uh, just after the Diwali break because pollutions were really high. So there is uh, some movement happening. It's slow, but uh, as in India, most things move slowly. Uh, uh, so the hope is one day uh, we'll reach where uh, uh, the discussion levels should be. But thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Jayashree, uh, Bhargav, Shikhar and Tariq, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this was a very, very important uh, and uh, learning conversation. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, and to everyone, uh, India would celebrate Republic Day tomorrow. So happy Republic Day. Uh, take care. Bye-bye. Happy Republic Day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.